The Mormon Church holds honesty as one of its central tenets. One of its articles of faith begins, We believe in being honest and true. Their scriptures warn of the dangers that accompany lies and deception. The Church teaches that lies are not just untrue statements, but that withholding or suppressing important information is the same as lying. Why is it then that those who leave the Church often say that one of their reasons is that the Church lied to them? This feeling of being betrayed by an institution that so many of them loved and gave their all to is, in my opinion, the biggest reason that people leave the church. How can this be for a church that teaches that honesty is of such importance that it is a requirement for entrance into their temples? The teachers in the church education system have been instructed not to reveal or talk about certain aspects of church history that might reflect negatively on the church or its past leaders. They have been warned of the serious repercussions they will face if they do not spin and present information in a strictly faith-promoting way. As our elder Packer has said before, we all know that there's a temptation to tell everything, whether it's worthy or faith-promoting or not. Some things that are true are not very useful. Church lesson manuals are written in such a way as to hide or rewrite embarrassing teachings or facts in order to make the doctrine of the church look as if it has always been consistent with the current teachings. For example, the membership is taught that Joseph Smith translated the Golden Plates to get the Book of Mormon. They publish wonderful paintings of Joseph translating the Golden Plates as he runs his fingers over the characters imprinted on them. However, every eyewitness account states that the translation process did not involve the plates. Instead, Joseph would gaze into his magic seer stones, which were placed in a hat, and dictate the text. The plates were usually in another room, hidden in the woods, or somewhere else. I don't see how that's relevant. I wish that I would have known that bit of information before I went on my mission and confidently testified to people that Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon from the characters on those golden plates. A person's testimony is very important within Mormonism. Members often claim to know the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith's experiences with the Divine, and many other things that they cannot possibly know. In fact, Mormons are instructed to bear their testimony, even if they do not have one. Another way to seek a testimony seems astonishing when compared with the methods of obtaining other knowledge. We gain or strengthen a testimony by bearing it. Someone even suggested that some testimonies are better gained on the feet bearing them than on the knees praying for them. This is an excellent way to make yourself believe just about anything by generating an artificial emotional experience. However, it is not a way to gain knowledge as much as it is a way to fool yourself. Oakes is encouraging people to lie in order to make themselves believe in the church. He is literally encouraging people to bear false witness. So while the church teaches the importance of honesty, we see that in practice that their teachers are instructed to cherry pick only the faith promoting information for their curriculum, leaving out the strange bits, and that the members are taught to testify about things that they may not have a testimony of. Mormons are being taught by their leaders that it is okay to be dishonest if it leads to faith in the church. The ends justify the means and it is okay to lie for the Lord. The church has a long history of doing this. Joseph Smith started taking secret plural wives sometime around 1833. He publicly denied that he practiced plural marriage his entire life. In May of 1844, Joseph was accused of being a polygamist by William Law. Joseph publicly denied this accusation. However, when he made his denial, he was already sealed to over 20 women, about a third of whom were already married. In a well-publicized debate between John Taylor and a Protestant minister in 1850, John Taylor denied the charge that the church practiced polygamy. To prove to his audience that the church was not, he read from the Doctrine and Covenants which said that strict monogamy was the law of the church. However, when he did this, Taylor was married to at least 12 women. The section of the Doctrine and Covenants that Taylor quoted from was added to the canon in 1835, while polygamy was being practiced in secret by Joseph. Even after Brigham Young publicly announced that the church was practicing plural marriage, it remained in the LDS scriptures for a couple of more decades before being removed and replaced with Joseph's revelation on polygamy. After church president Wilford Woodruff published a manifesto on polygamy, church leaders, including Woodruff, 
continued to take wives and or perform plural marriages in secret. No one was punished for this post-manifesto polygamy until 1811, when Apostle John W. Taylor was excommunicated for performing plural marriages. Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon illegally started a bank in Kirtland after being denied by the Ohio government. So they called it an anti-banking company, whatever that is, and lied about having the capital to back up their banknotes by displaying chests of junk covered with a thin layer of silver coins to potential investors. The church has edited, rewritten, added, and removed many sections of their scriptures and publications in order to make it seem like Mormon doctrine has always been consistent with the current teachings of the church. While there are many more examples, some may say that these things are all in the past and that the current leadership does not lie to us and that we can trust them. It's behind us. Look. That's behind us. Don't worry about those little flicks of history. Is this true? Has the leadership of the church truly put the practice of lying for the Lord behind them? I hold in my hand that book, the very copy from which Hiram read, the same corner of the page turned down still visible. Something is wrong. Something fictional. Previous to Holland's talk, the Church News published some pictures of Hiram's book. If we compare the pictures of that book with the one that Holland is waving around, we can see that they are not the same book. Shortly after this talk, when this criticism was first being raised, the Church came out and said that the Church News was wrong and that Holland did have the correct book complete with the corner of the page still turned down. So it turns out there are two books that may have been the one that Hiram had, both with the corner turned down. I don't know, maybe he was using both hands. Or maybe the church is trying to cover up Holland being less than honest by giving him a way to save face. But I would like to make an appeal to them on behalf of the church to clearly make that distinction, that to not include Mormon with the word uh, polygamous, uh, to not identify the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormon Church, with polygamy. Uh, they're entirely separate. There's no connection of any kind with uh, any polygamist groups. Uh, this confusion clearly doesn't serve us well. I completely agree with Elder Cook. I mean, other than introducing plural marriage, practicing it for 80 years, being led by a polygamist prophet for 112 years, continuing to allow widowed men who were sealed to their first wife to be sealed to their second and having it still taught as an essential part of becoming a god in their scriptures the Mormon church has nothing to do with polygamy I don't know where people get that idea in my country uh, we say people's churches, the Protestants, the Catholics they publish all their budgets yeah. only, to all the public yeah. why uh, it's impossible for your church well, we simply think that the, that information belongs to those who made the contribution and not to the world. That's the only thing. Yes. Really? When did that start? I never saw any financial numbers when I was a full tithe paying member and I worked as a ward finance clerk. None of the other tithe paying members I have ever known over the years have ever seen that kind of information either. I don't want to call Hinkley a liar, but... Well, I don't know how to finish that sentence. Liar! Have you think reading? Smith deciphered Egyptian hieroglyphs, creating the Mormon Book of Abraham. Years later, one Oxford Egyptologist called Smith's version an impudent fraud. With a prophet taking a funeral scroll, airbrushing out an embarrassing phallus, and sticking a man's head on a jackal god. Joseph Smith got these papyri and he translated them and subsequently as the Egyptian Egyptologists cracked the code something completely different all I'm saying out. all I'm all I'm saying is that what got translated got translated into the Word of God the vehicle for that I do not understand and don't claim to know and know no Egyptian this was a nice sidestep by Holland to avoid any more questions on the subject but is it an honest move Joseph Smith claimed that the Book of Abraham 
was a translation of some ancient records that have fallen into our hands from the catacombs of Egypt. The writings of Abraham while he was in Egypt called the Book of Abraham, written by his own hand upon papyrus. Joseph recorded in his journal that he was translating the characters on the Egyptian papyrus and claimed that they were the writings of the biblical figure Abraham. The drawings accompanying the text are referenced by the text as an illustration of the story. The church currently teaches this to its members in the church's instruction manuals. So for Holland to just dismiss the papyrus as some kind of unrelated revelatory vehicle is a denial of official church doctrine and the claims of Joseph Smith. It does not honestly reflect what the church claims and teaches. I want to find out more about the mysterious Strengthening Church Members Committee. Off to the church to meet its chief spokesman and the mastermind behind the I Am A Mormon campaign, Michael Purdy. What's the Strengthening Church Members Committee? And does it still exist? Uh, I don't know, and I'm not, I guess that's a question not f for me, I, I, I couldn't tell you that, I don't know. You're the head of media relations for the church, right. and I've spoken to people, um, ex-members of the church, who say um, the Strengthening Church Members Committee does exist. Does it still exist? I, I, I've heard that, yeah, there is a Strengthening Church Members Committee, but I couldn't tell you the details of how that works, but we'd be happy to provide someone that can. Sorry for my confusion. When I originally asked you, you, you weren't sure. Now you, you do know that it exists, and, and you will give me somebody who knows something about it. Absolutely. Liar! Elder Thomas B. Marsh, who sided with his wife through all of this, became angrier with each successive decision. So angry, in fact, that he went before a magistrate and swore that the Mormons were hostile toward the state of Missouri. His affidavit led to, or at least was a factor, in Governor Lilburn Boggs' cruel extermination order, which resulted in over 15,000 saints being driven from their homes with all the terrible suffering and consequent death that followed. All of this occurred because of a disagreement over the exchange of milk and cream. In this general conference address, Church President Thomas Monson distorts and embellishes the historical record of why Marsh left the church. Marsh and fellow apostle Orson Hyde left the church in protest over the burning of Gallatin, Missouri by a group of Mormons. Monson knows this. I have an earlier video where I break out just how dishonest this talk is. Please go watch that if you have not already. Let's talk about Mitt Romney, okay. the man who may well become the most powerful man on earth. Mm -hmm. As a Mormon in the temple, I've been told, he would have sworn an oath to say that he would not pass on what happens in the temple lest he slit his throat. Is that true? That's not true. That's not true. He's really good. Liar! Let's look at the facts, shall we? We do not have penalties in the temple. You used to. We used to. And there's the truth! The most, potentially, the most powerful man on the world has sworn an oath, which he meant at the time, whatever it is now, that he must not tell anyone about what he's seen, lest he slit his throat. That he would not tell anyone about his personal pledge to the Lord. The penalties, as Holland calls them, were removed from the temple in 1990, several decades after Mick got his endowments and was married in the temple. So he would have promised to slit his throat if he ever revealed the signs and tokens of the priesthood. Holland knows this. I'm not an idiot. Fortunately, Sweeney pushes Holland to admit this because he would not have otherwise. But even then, Holland distorts what they were about. Now, even though I went to the temple only a year after they were removed, I did not find out about the penalties in the temple until a few years ago. I am appalled that they were ever part of a ceremony that was supposed to be the most holy ritual in all of religion. I have demonstrated that the church has a history of lying, a policy of lying, and that the current leadership continues to lie all in order to defend and promote the Mormon faith. 
In my experience, I have found that when a devout member learns of some of the hidden doctrines and advanced histories, they tend to feel deceived or lied to. Because of the church policy of only teaching the faith-promoting things, some members feel that they have made many of the most important decisions of their lives based on faulty or incomplete information. This causes more angst, injury, and loss of faith than do the issues themselves. It causes more damage than anything else could. The most important part of Mormon theology is, in my opinion, the plan of salvation. According to the doctrine, there was a war in heaven between God and the devil over whether or not man would be free to choose for himself. Those that fought for man's free agency won and got to come to earth and get a body and exercise their free will. Central to this plan is the right for people to search and find out what is right and wrong, what is true and false. By hiding and distorting information, the church is manipulating the choices that people make. It is hijacking their free agency for its own benefit. And that is the most anti-Mormon position that anyone can take.